Hello again and welcome back to EASD TV. So we're talking adjunct therapies, very, very interesting session, very well attended. And I have with me Jerry Greenfield from Australia and Hussam Ghanim from the USA. So Hussam, first of all, what are we talking about when we're talking about adjunct therapies? And this of course is for type one diabetes. Thank you for hosting us. Um, as you know, type 1 diabetic, diabetic patients have been treated since the 1920s with insulin and insulin only. Uh, there is a need for better control, metabolic, and to reverse complications. And therefore, we try to use additional therapies that are currently approved for type 2 diabetes management to see if they will work also in type 1. Obviously, those drugs have additional effects that are not beta cell dependent because most of the type 1s have lost their ability to secrete insulin. So we have to look, be, look beyond that and use additional therapies that will work independent of the beta cell function. So we have started basically studies as well as have good data on use of GLP-1 receptor agonist as well as GL, SGLT2 inhibitors. And we are seeing good data and we presented some interesting outcomes that are promising for the future of treatment of, uh, of type 1 diabetes. So now we're going to seamlessly segue to you uh, to talk about GLP-1 agonists. It's a bit of a noise from a trolley, but <laughs> <laughs> appeared on cue as ever. Yes, right. uh, tell us about GLP-1 agonists in type 1 diabetes. Well, the, the, many studies have been undertaken now to look at the, the benefits of the GLP-1 receptor drugs in type 2 diabetes, and there's no doubt that they improve diabetes control, they lower weight, they improve metabolic risk factors, and ultimately reduce the risk of heart disease in type 2 diabetes. And we know that people with type 1 diabetes have an excess of heart disease, but also many people with type 1 diabetes are also overweight and have other cardiovascular risk factors. And therefore, there has been this thinking that maybe if we use these drugs that we know are beneficial in type 2 diabetes and people with type 1 diabetes, we might see some of the beneficial effects. The, the, the problem, in a way, is that these drugs work in part by acting on the beta cell and increasing insulin secretion, and typically people with type 1 diabetes have low levels or no insulin secretion. But if you look hard enough, some of the more recent studies using better C-peptide assays have actually shown that people with type 1 diabetes often do have a degree of insulin secretion, and therefore these drugs might be beneficial. So a kind of ghost secretion. That's right. If you look hard enough, if you measure after a meal or a mixed meal tolerance test, but the greatest benefit of the GLP-1 receptor drugs, um, almost certainly in people with type 1 diabetes, is on weight. Um, it reduces weight probably about by, by about four kilograms, but there are benefits in people that appear to have retained insulin secretion. HbA1c does a drop by about 0.4 percent, so it is they do have a you know a, a promise in people with type one diabetes. So how do you pick which people with type one diabetes should have? these drugs? Well, that's the million dollar question really. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one. We don't really know and the studies haven't been done to identify the factors that are going to predict responsiveness to the medications. But overall it appears that those individuals with type 1 diabetes who are overweight or obese, who have other cardiovascular risk factors, are likely to benefit from these drugs through weight loss and those that have retained insulin secretion as measured by the C-peptide also might get a benefit. But we only have evidence for the weekly drug, liraglutide. We don't have any evidence yet published randomised studies of semaglutide, the weekly drug, and potentially tazepatide in the future might also hold some benefit and promise, but we don't have that data as yet. Now, we're missing Parth Narendran, who was the other speaker in this symposium, who would have talked about uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So, Hassan, can I ask you, what about those as an adjunct therapy? Well, to follow up on what Jerry has mentioned, uh, and he's absolutely right, type 1 uh, patients with di type 1 diabetes have increased risk of cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and they also have excess weight because now they are living longer. Uh, so the, the, the adjunct therapies that are currently being tested will target not only the A1C and metabolic changes, but also look at reduction in weight, blood pressure, and cardiovascular risk, and also kidney disease risk. So we have actually went ahead and tried and started an experiment with the support from JDRF to test semaglutide, which is the most recent uh, GLB-1 receptor agonist in type 1 diabetes, 
And on top of that, we added uh, dabagliflozin, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor in a combination therapy. So not only one drug, but two additional drugs on top of insulin management. Again, the goal is not to only uh, produce a great A1C reduction for these patients, which they need, but also to achieve all these additional benefits of, that are known for these drugs, including weight loss, weight loss reduction, improvement in blood pressure, uh, reduction in inflammation, uh, improvement in their cardiovascular risk factors, and um, maybe protect their kidneys as well. So we are currently you know, in the middle of the study. Hopefully by the next uh, year and a half, maybe we'll have data on semaglutidin type 1 as well as in SGLT2 in type 1 in combination with GLB receptor agonist. SGLT2 inhibitors have been approved in Europe for treatment for type 1. At least dabagliflozin is one of those, uh, the, uh, one member of the class that has been recently approved. Um, it's not widely used, but it's, nevertheless it's approved because of the uh, benefits. Uh, the goal of combining GLB-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors is to actually benefit from the uh, uh, kind of nulling effect of each other in the terms of side effects. For example, uh, we know that uh, SGLT2 inhibitors could increase the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. And we know that GLB-1 receptor agonists suppress glucagon. So these two effects could kind of work hand in hand to reduce that risk of DKA while still improve the quality of metabolic control by further reducing A1C and induce better weight loss. So we are hopeful that this study will become very successful. And as uh, to follow up on the question that you said, uh, which, what kind of patients we're going to pick for that? We are picking those overweight and obese patients because those will be the best target uh, for such therapy. Um, I feel a poly pill coming up, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> Where there's, both are combined in a, in a single pill. Or single. Well, that's right. I mean, yeah. I, I agree 100 percent. I mean, we need to think about all of the pathophysiological processes that contribute to the metabolic abnormalities in, in type 1 diabetes and attack it from many different sizes. And it's interesting, there are a few studies, and I presented one about the, um, the uh, unmet needs of, of people with type 1 diabetes. And time in range and, 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 and weight uh, are, are major issues that are really unmet uh, needs, and we haven't been uh, addressing them appropriately in people with type 1 diabetes. But these drugs, either alone or in combination, will hopefully improve those. And we've done a recent survey looking at who is actually prescribing these off-label in people with type 1 diabetes, and they're very commonly prescribed for certain patients who might get metabolic benefit. So let me throw another mix into the cocktail mix of tazepatide. Is, is that another possibility in this kind of poly-prescribing? I think that Jenny came out of the box and it has to be tested in type 1. I'm not sure when, but we are ready to basically test that once we show that at least the semaglutide the once weekly that we are testing now will prove to be very uh, eff effective in managing type 1. Uh, again, uh, as uh, uh, Jerry mentioned, it's, uh, it, we have to look at the whole picture. We're not just targeting A1C control. And we know trisibitide has a significant A1C reduction and an amazing weight loss reduction. And for those patients who are obese and overweight, I think that will be their um, go-to medication maybe for the future. Um, we have to still see the safety profile in the type 2, maybe look carefully before, before we test it in type 1, but we are excited about it. Uh, I want to just follow up on what Jerry mentioned again. When we improve all these uh, endpoints, I think what, what matters to the patients is their quality of life. You're touching on their uh, uh, security and predictability when they know that their glucose will always be in range versus sometimes it's hyperglycemic in the higher range and sometimes it's a lower range and that's where they fear you know having a low an episode of hypoglycemia where they are asleep these drugs help reduce that mm -hmm. and because you are needing less insulin when you need less fast acting insulin there will be less oscillation in your blood sugars and therefore you have a, a steady state kind of glycemia that will give that patient a sense of security and safety and when they lose the weight i think they will feel better and therefore their quality of life and engagement in society will also improve. Adjunct therapy cocktails, I have a feeling they might be here to stay. 
I think so. I mean, it's exciting times for people with type 1 diabetes. Insulin works effectively, but we have many new drugs that are being developed for type 2 diabetes that will hopefully also have benefit for type 1 diabetes. And uh, uh, we really need to think about and include patients with type 1 diabetes in our research to better inform some of the outcomes, but also the, the choice of drugs that we're using and how we actually uh, predict that we'll get benefit. Fantastic. Thank you both so much. Uh, uh, this was really a very, very interesting session, and I think it's of relevance to so many people working out there in practice every day. So do catch up with it on the EASD web service. Bye for now.